Hey everybody, today we're going to look at an AWS platform architecture for Chen AI. Uh, I'm going to react to it and give you my thoughts as a data engineer on this architecture. You can find the original link to this video in the description of this video. So let's get into it. All right, here we are. Let's listen to it and let's see what they've done. Hi, I'm Josh from AWS. And I'm John from Innovative Solutions, and this is my architecture. So John, Innovative Solutions builds a variety of solutions as an AWS Premier Partner for a variety of customers looking to do things like adopt Gen AI, as I understand it. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, what you've built here? Absolutely. This is our architecture we call Tailwinds. Mm -hmm. We have two flows that come into Tailwinds. One is an indexing flow, and one is the front end of that indexing flow. Okay, so indexing, most likely data will come in here. Most likely data will come in through here, and then the UI will actually be able to then get data from the API. I'm guessing where they get data from DynamoDB have that as the central store let's see indexing okay so to start with the indexing flow um, i see some things like s3 buckets i see dynamodb can you tell me a little bit about how data actually gets into the architecture and, and why data coming in here can be in any format um, we can also take it in in s3 uh, we also have ways of taking it in through an api gateway once that data comes in that's where it comes into this etl here okay so Okay, let's quickly go back. So that can also come through API gateway. Most likely then, I'm guessing it will get stored here somewhere. Here. Whenever they say any format, ah, most likely not any format. But let's, let's continue. Once that data comes in, that's where it comes into this ETL here. Okay. okay, so the ETL is Lambda. Did you consider a service like uh, AWS Glue when making that decision? As a matter of fact, we do. We sometimes swap that out. It's, it's kind of the overarching theme that you're going to see here is that this is a very customizable solution. Yeah, I actually noticed you said like any, any type of data, right? Any type mm -hmm. of data format. How flexible mm -hmm. is that S3 bucket icon there? How, how much um, can you flip? Anything that. you can store in there, we can take in and start to read. Um, and that's the beauty, really, of using services like Lambda and S3, is you can really customize it to your needs. But the thing is, you can like you cannot build a single Lambda function that does it all, right? So most likely you would have multiple Lambda functions here that actually take different um, or access different data types and then processes it. And how you do this is whenever the data is coming in, it's actually triggering the Lambda function and then the Lambda function reads the data from S3. So pretty standard, I'd say. And of course, with glue, you not only or you not always need glue because if the data is small and if it's not coming in very crazy amounts, you can work very well with Lambda really of using services like Lambda and S3 is you can really customize it to your needs. Okay. And then this is the indexing flow. Mm -hmm. So it, does it eventually come here to open search? Absolutely. So once it comes out of this here, whether you're using Glue or Lambda, uh, that's when we store it in the vector database. We've also used a graph database to do the same thing. Okay. Yeah, I guess that's, that's the typical thing that everybody does, right? They, because they're going to index the data here and through open search. I haven't actually used open search. But that's the typical thing because then you can actually work and train your Gen AI on it or you could use like retrieval augmented generation rack to then look in the data and answer uh, or create answers from the data. Stored in the vector database. We've also used a graph database to do the same thing. Okay, so the trade-offs of um, graph databases, Vexor databases, do you give customers that choice or are you making that choice on the back end? Uh, both. We give the customers choice, but we also educate the customers on business cases and their use cases to help them pick the right service. So mm -hmm. we've got the data, we've got it sort of indexed, we, can, we have a lot of capabilities here now. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me about the consumer flow now? 
this Absolutely. API gateway? So out here we have uh, applications. Uh, we also have things like chatbots, like uh, Lex or uh, IBM X. Uh, all of those things come in and hit this API gateway here. So the API gateway is kind of the gatekeeper. That comes in and hits our Lambda processing here. When you heard me talk about a chatbot, we also have uh, the ability. One sec. So this is very, I mean, this this whole thing, we've seen this. So have, come on, come you, back. So this here, this structure of you have apps here. And these apps then use the API gateway with uh, authentication to then get the data from the lambda because once you make a call to the api gateway this is going to go back into the lambda function and then have in the lambda function your um yeah, your method like get get blah, blah 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 and then this will start and this will work and get the data so this is a very standard thing that we see all the time uh the ability to record a chat session or a chat state. Okay, so you can provide sort of a chat interface that, mm -hmm. that stores that session yep. and you're powering that by holding the session data in DynamoDB? We certainly can, but chat is only really one piece of it. It's really meant to, to be almost the backend processing. So from an application or from, um, from something other than a chat, uh, basically mm -hmm. anything that can hit this API gateway. So it sounds like there's a lot of flexibility in the types of applications that your customers can use to go through this flow. If we go like the with the DynamoDB, that is something we see within ChatGPT all the time, right? You have on the left, you have your your chats where you've chatted with ChatGPT. That is basically this. This is your your chat storage. So this is where all the inputs from you go. This is where all the previous inputs from the uh, AI go go here so we have sort of the uh lambda processing is this the brains of the operation here is this orchestrating a lot of what we see over here absolutely so in this processing here this is kind of where the magic happens we can really program this to be very flexible and to do all kinds of things like call out to a graph database or call out to a another relational database to get mm -hmm. information in to add to that uh that motion of getting information from things so you can see Things like our vector database here from, from the vector database but also from potentially other databases here right so this can go anywhere they most likely they have different data sources that they are not showing us here as well so all of that goes into this processing and then that is what's getting sent over to our LLM so this lambda can be uh, highly customizable. You're doing things like semantic search, you're doing, you're searching graph databases, you're customizing that to the needs of whatever this application is. Is that exactly, is that right? exactly. What were some of the trade offs you made with choosing to do this inside this Lambda that's kind of orchestrating all of these complex tasks versus mm -hmm. some of the other decisions you could have made? Absolutely. A lot of folks will look at this and say, hey, this looks a lot like knowledge bases. Mm -hmm. and, and in truth, it does a lot of the same things, but it's expanded. So knowledge bases are a great tool and they do some very good things. This gives you even more <laughs> flexibility. Yes, yeah, so you had some really specific needs, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned knowledge bases. Mm -hmm. So let's go to Bedrock. Um, with the model choices available in Bedrock, is that something where your customers can choose different models? Do you help them evaluate models? How do you handle that? Yes, so uh, along with this Tailwinds architecture, we do a lot of consulting. We do a lot of asking about business cases and business uses to help the customer understand what it is that they're choosing. So all of this choice, you have to pick the right thing for the right problem. Um, and that's the same with Amazon Bedrock if we're looking at models. Mm -hmm. So. That's really cool. And one of the things that I think is most interesting is you're abstracting away a lot of the technical know-how, but customers get full autonomy over the business. Let's quickly, just quickly want to go back here. So basically what they said with knowledge basis is this is, this is where your knowledge data is, right? On the, here's, here's it indexed on the right where that's the incoming data and you can actually access that incoming data from your Lambda function, and this is where your chats 
uh, previous chats are, this is where you can then store the interaction and you can get the, or you can ask questions and get results as well here from Bedrock. So that is very interesting how they build it like this. And people can basically choose here the model that they have or that they want to use. Is that something where your customers, with the model choices available on Bedrock, is that something where your customers can choose different models? Do you help them evaluate models? How do you handle that? Yes. So uh, along with this Tailwinds architecture, we do a lot of consulting. We do a lot of asking about business cases and business uses to help the customer understand what it is that they're choosing. So all of this choice, you have to pick the right thing for the right problem. Um, and that's the same with Amazon Bedrock if we're looking at models. So. That's really cool. And one of the things that I think is most interesting is you're abstracting away a lot of the technical know-how, but customers get full autonomy over the business decisions. You know, they get to have so much flexibility in terms of, I want this kind of data, I want to use this kind of model. Um, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. The challenge I see with that is how can you have so much customization at scale with so many customers building all these different environments? How do you, how do you tackle that challenge? Serverless. That's the big thing here. Serverless. Glad you asked. Uh, we do SAM and we do um, Terraform. So we do a lot of different ways of doing infrastructure as code. Mm -hmm. And as long as we can build it in infrastructure as code, it becomes very portable. Yeah, so you're mm -hmm. able to keep that flexibility, but also quickly deploy environments for customers. Yes. That's great. This is a really cool architecture, John. Thanks for sharing it with us. You're quite welcome. Yeah, so as I said here, this basically this whole architecture this is how they can spin everything up for individual customers and every customer has their own deployment here okay cool use case as you see everything is serverless and that's one of the big things that makes it very flexible uh, of course it's going to be more difficult than they said because if you say i can get any data and index it you need to ha create the Lambda functions for this. Uh, also for the processing, the Lambda functions that we saw on the lower side here, that is also something that right? you need to uh, spend a lot of time in creating this lower Lambda function here. So this is, this is where the engineers will spend the most time and actually uh, getting these Lambda functions here fixed. DynamoDB, that's not a, a big issue. Uh, this uh, search indexing, yeah, not so much. And Bedrock, if you choose a, a pre-selected model, that as well. Uh, I'm not sure they have they haven't mentioned actually this connection here. So I would it would be very interesting to see this. Um, but yeah, cool architecture. Um, let me know in the questions below. What do you think? Um, what you ha would have done differently, or do you think that is a, a good architecture? And then see you in the next video.